Well, good evening once again, and I just want to thank the Christians here in Moncton for the invitation to come and share the Word of God during this past week, and for all that have supported the meetings. We just really appreciate it. It would be awfully lonesome stood here speaking to myself, so thank you for all of you that have come and supported these meetings. I got uh, three readings that I'd like to do this evening, beginning in Nehemiah chapter 6. They're all short, uh, just a couple of verses Uh, in 6 and 7, and then uh, a longer reading in chapter 8. So beginning in chapter 6, I'm going to just uh, read verse uh, 1 down to verse 4, and then verses 15 and 16. So Nehemiah 6, verse 1, it says this, Now it came to pass when Sambalat and Tobiah and Geshem, the Arabian, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had builded the wall and that there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. And then please, chapter 7, just verses 1 and 2. Oh, sorry, verse 15 and 16 of chapter 6 first, and then we'll do chapter 7. Verse 15, so the wall was finished in the 20 and 5th day of the month Elul in fifty and two days. And it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof, and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. Now chapter 7, verse 1 and 2, it says this, Now it came to pass when the wall was built, And I had set up the doors, and the porters and the singers and the Levites were appointed, that I gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the ruler of the palace, charge over Jerusalem, for he was a faithful man and feared God above many. And then please, final reading, chapter 8, we'll just read the first eight verses of chapter 8. So it says this, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate, and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and the women and those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattiah and Shema and Aniah and Urijah Hilkiah and Messiah, and uh, on his right hand and on his left hand, Padiah, Mishael, Malchiah, Hashem, and Hashbadana, Zechariah, Meshulam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen. Amen, with lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, uh, Jeshua and Bani and Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, uh, Shabbatai, uh, Hodijah, Messiah, uh, Kelita, Azariah, Jozebad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read in the book, in the law of God distinctly, and gave the sense, 
and cause them to understand the reading. And again, God will add a blessing to the reading of his precious word to us this evening. Now, the reason I read from these three sections is I want to just make some remarks in chapter 6, chapter 7, and then spend the most of our time in chapter 8. But the first thing to notice in chapter 6 is that uh, despite every attempt of the enemy to uh, bring the work to a halt, they had basically failed. And so the next thing that they try is compromise. If they cannot, in it, as it were, use external force uh, or even internal dissension uh, to stop the work of God, uh, the next tactic of the enemy is to get his people to compromise. And so basically, uh, they want um, uh, Nehemiah uh, to come for a meeting with Sambalat and Geshem. And uh, of course, these people have been the enemies from the very beginning. And now they're saying, well, actually, I'll tell you what, let's, let's try to be friends. Let's get together. Let's, let's have a discussion. Let's try and work these things out. And of course, there's only one thought in their minds, and, and Nehemiah understood. He says at the end of verse 2, but they thought to do me mischief. And so it was just a ruse. They just wanted to get him away from the city, away from the protection of the walls, get him out into the plain of Ono. And when they got him there, they were going to kill him. That was the plan. But, but I want us to just learn a simple lesson. I think it's an important lesson that uh, if you look at church history, you will notice that um, it begins usually with persecution of those that preach the simple gospel of the grace of God. And usually there's persecuted by religious bodies and denominations, and they will try and, as it were, put out the flame of the gospel that is spreading. And so when that fails, then they'll try other methodologies and uh, uh, intrigue, different things, whatever, uh, uh, ridicule, all the things that we've seen. But if they can't do that, and, and I want to suggest to you that it, it, the ecumenical movement has done more, in a sense, to destroy the clarity of the gospel than just about anything else. Let's come down and let's sit together, let's talk. And it's amazing, I've seen things like evangelicals and Catholics together. Now, again, Paul says, if anybody preaches any other gospel than the one that I preach, let him be anathema. He don't say, let's get together and work out our differences. Let him be anathema. Put him under a divine curse. That's, that's God's remedy. And so, again, uh, Nehemiah is being told, uh, come on, let's get together, let's meet. And I love his, his answer, verse 3. I sent messengers unto them saying, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? I'm doing a great work. I cannot come. In other words, what he's, what, the message for us is this. Brethren, don't get sidetracked. The work that God has called us to do, let's do it and not be sidetracked down bypath meadows into all these things that are just going to uh, result in nothing. Let's just keep on preaching the gospel. Let's keep on doing what God has called us to do. Avoid the compromise. Avoid the temptation to get into these things. And let's just keep on with the work of God. There are souls around us perishing everywhere. We don't have time to get involved in this stuff. Just do the work of God. Get on with it. But I can't help but reading this and be reminded of the Lord Jesus. You see, they're, they're saying... Come down, leave the work. And he says, I can't. I'm doing a great work, and I can't come down. And remember when the Lord Jesus is on the cross, and they're saying, if you are the Christ, the Son of God, come down, show that you really are who you claim to be, come down. And, and I can just, the Lord, not putting words into the Lord Jesus' mouth, mouth, but I know that he knew he was doing a great work, and there's no way he's coming down until that work is finished. And it's interesting that the work that Nehemiah was doing, we started out earlier in the week. Some of you may have missed it, but I want you to look at Isaiah 60 just for a second, just to be reminded of the work that he is doing. And of course, we know that he's building the walls and setting up the gates. In Isaiah 60, you'll notice in verse 18, it says, Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders, but thou shalt call thy, world, thy walls salvation and thy gates praise. 
Now again, put that in terms of the Lord Jesus hanging on Calvary's cross. I'm not coming down because what, what work is he doing? He's bringing about salvation that is going to result in eternal praise to both he and his father throughout all eternity. And so the walls of, and, and the gates, speaking of salvation and praise, I cannot come down, I am doing a great work. And of course, we notice uh, just in verse 15 and 16 of chapter 6, it says the wall was finished in the 20 and 5th day of the month, Elul, 50 and 2 days. And just think of what has been accomplished. Now these walls, this is not like a little garden wall here. These walls are thick walls. If you've ever been to Jerusalem and seen some of the walls there, I mean, we're talking several feet thick, or I don't know what that would be, several meters thick. I guess I'll try and speak your language here. Uh, I, I, Long time since I've had to deal with those things. But you get the idea. Thick, thick walls. This is a major, major project. And yet, a united people with, with leadership that's keeping, them, keeping the vision before them. And what are they accomplishing? Tremendous things in 52 days. What could be accomplished if we were really united under the cause of the gospel banner? I think we could accomplish tremendous things. In a short space of time, if we could just get on the same page and get the message out there and do the work. And so tremendous things are accomplished. Praise God for it, 52 days. And so uh, notice that the work is so remarkable because verse 16, it says, It came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes for they perceived that this work was wrought of God. And I tell you, I just love that. Uh, the, the en- this is the enemies acknowledging God has done something here. <laughs> right? I mean, can you imagine how hard it would be for them to say that? But they have no option to... This is a, this is a marvel that they've witnessed and they, even though they've tried everything they could to stop it, at the end of the day, they have to say, this is a work that was wrought of God. And as some of us are praying for revival, we're asking to be part of a work where the only explanation is God. That people will have to acknowledge, God has done something here. And oh, to be part of a work like that. It's not based on some charismatic preacher, not based on some person with, you know, with, with, with great eloquence. It's, this is a work that God has done. And so often in revival, God has used uh, ordinary people uh, and done extraordinary things. And people have just been left with one conclusion. Look what God has done. That's what we want to be part of. Something that he gets all the glory, he gets all the credit, and even the enemies have to acknowledge God has done this work. Now, uh, having said those things, uh, notice chapter 7. It says, now it came to pass, this is verse 1, when the wall was built. And I had set up the doors and the porters and the singers and the Levites were appointed. So, so now, not only is the wall finished, but the gates are up. Uh, all of it's completed. The work is finished. He's getting uh, the, the Le- Levites and, and porters to keep the gates, singers, all of this. And then, then he's passing on leadership now uh, to make sure the work continues. And I noticed that he mentions his brother, uh, my brother Hanani, and, and Hananiah, but um, I want you to notice that passing leadership on, it, it's not just because this man is his brother, but I want you to notice what it says at the end of the verse there. He was a faithful man and feared God above many. You see, the important thing is not human relationships or blood relationships. The important thing is, is he a faithful man? Does he fear God above many? You see, if you pass it on to somebody else and it's just keeping it in the family, if the next generation are not men that are faithful men and fearing God, it's going to be an absolute disaster. It, it, the, the criteria has, the work has to be handed over. And Paul says this, right? The things you've learned amongst many witnesses, commit them to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And so it has to be faithful men and it has to be men that fear God. And we need to make sure that that happens. And so certainly there's a passing on of leadership. And the chapter is much 
connected with administration of the city now that it's built and the walls are, are finished. And, and really, it's all about that. And also getting people to move into Jerusalem from various places, the resettlement of the cities, everything like that. Very interesting chapter. We don't have time to deal with that tonight. I want us to end in chapter 8. And the reason I want us to end in chapter 8 is because chapter 8 deals with what I consider to be the Watergate Revival. Now, I want to just talk a little bit about the Watergate. <laughs> we said earlier when we were looking at the gates of Jerusalem uh, that the Watergate symbolizes the Word of God. Remember the fountain gate, uh, just typology-wise, that, that uh, bubbling water uh, speaks of the Spirit, still water speaks of the Word of God. And so the uh, the water gate, it's symbolic of the Word of God. So this is a revival, and it's certainly we're going to see how appropriate it is that this revival takes place at the water gate because the Word of God plays a, a very prominent role in it. In fact, if you just take a minute to look with me in chapter 8, notice the, the dominance of the phrase, the book. And so you'll see it in verse 1. Uh, all the people gathered themselves together as one man to the street that was before the water gate. They spake to Ezra the scribe to bring the book. Uh, notice again in verse 3, right at the end of verse 3, uh, those that could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book uh, of the law. The book, though, is the key phrase I want you to see. Verse 5, Ezra opened the book. Uh, chapter 8, So uh, verse 8, so they read in the book, in the law of God distinctly. And then the final reference, verse 18, also day by day from the first day unto the last day, he read in the book of the law of God. And so obviously the Holy Spirit is placing a tremendous emphasis because of this repetition on this idea of the book, the prominence of the book. And let me just say this, that you, you won't ever have a revival without giving the book, and I'm not talking of any other book, but this book, the book, its primary place amongst the people of God. Revival will always come as a result of the book that is brought before the people and presented to the people. Now, I, I don't know if you remember, uh, some of you younger people won't know what I'm talking about, but some of the older ones will remember this, but there was a terrible scandal in the United States of America and it was all connected with a place called Watergate. It was during the days of President Nixon. In fact, it lost him the presidency. And it was a, a big, big scandal. And so often in people's minds, especially older people, you talk about Watergate, Watergate, it's got really negative connotations. Tonight, we want to give some positive connotations to Watergate, okay? Just give a different viewpoint. And we want to talk about a revival. Now, let me just talk about revival just for a minute before we get down to the details. I'm going to give you six characteristics of spiritual revival from Nehemiah chapter 8 this evening. So we could know what it looked like if it really happened. But uh, let me just say this, that revival is always connected with God's people. Okay? It's different to awakening. There are two completely different terms, revival and awakening. Usually they're, they're different terms, but they're connected. Let me explain what I mean. So, so revival, the, ver the very word revival means basically life again. Re and then vive is life. Okay? Life again. And so the idea is this, that these are people that have life, but it's, it's at a very low ebb spiritually. So, so they, they truly have life, but, but it's, it's just things are at a very, very low ebb spiritually. And I'd say you could say much of North American Christianity, there's life there, but it's at a low ebb generally. Okay? And revival is when that low ebb, suddenly there's a new spark of life. And it's almost like they're living again. There's, there's energy, there's passion, there's reality. And it's always the people of God that experience revival. Now, when the people of God experience revival, one of the definite effects of that is that usually there's a corresponding awakening amongst the lost world. Now, the idea of awakening is that, that outside of those that have life, 
there are people that are dead. Right? Dead in their trespasses and sins. The, the world out there are people who are spiritually dead. Right? And, and one of the reasons that they're in that condition is because when they look at the church, they don't see much reality and much evidence of life in the church. And so a lot of them say, if that's Christianity, I'm not really interested. And, and, and so... Uh, biggest excuse for people not coming to Christ often is Christians. I don't want to be like those people, right? I mean, and, and it's tragic, but it's true. If all of a sudden the church becomes what God always intended it to be, suddenly filled and brimming with new life and new reality, the world's excuse goes out of the window. And they see real Christianity, and they say, I want that. What that person's got, that's what I want. And so there's a desperate need today for spiritual revival. And again, let's be honest. It's easy to say the church needs revival. We need to ask the question personally, what about me? What, what's my spiritual life like tonight? Is it vibrant? Is it passionate? Have I, am I living this overflowing life? Could it be said of me that out of my innermost being is flowing rivers of living water? Is that how I'd be described by somebody? What do people think of when they look at me in terms of my Christian testimony? Because I think it's easy to say, oh yeah, definitely the church needs revival. But you know where it begins? Right here. It begins in my heart and your heart. If we're going to see revival, it'll start when individuals see, I need this. I've become complacent. I've got used to this. I'm going through the motions. I've lost the vigor that I once had when I was newly converted. And so... When that happens, one of the usual things is that the lost world suddenly take notice. They're, they're taking notice right now, but for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> they see the scandals. They see the failures. They see all those things. But when revival comes, they see something very different. So what are the six characteristics of revival that are in this chapter. And why is this chapter even here in the book of Nehemiah? Well, we could say this, that if we remember the reason why the walls were knocked down in the first place was because God was disciplining his people because they'd got so far away from him. That's why he used Nebuchadnezzar as his instrument to destroy Jerusalem because they had just got so far away from God. So it was, it was a disciplinary act of God, chastising his people. Now they're back again, and they've got these walls built. But the problem is, you see, if you have the walls built, but if the people's hearts are no different, guess what's going to happen again? God's going to have to chastise them again. He's going to have to do the same thing again. And so what Nehemiah is doing is in the first uh, seven chapters, really, first six chapters, it, it's, it's rebuilding the walls the last chapters is reviving the people. That's what it's all about. Getting the people in the condition they need to be so the walls can stay standing. So they're not going to be knocked down again as an act of divine chastisement. But I want you to notice where this all begins. It actually doesn't begin with Nehemiah or even the leadership. We'll notice where it begins. It says in verse 1, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man, into the street that was before the water gate, and they spake to Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. So it, it begins, and the, this is the first point that I want us to see, is that it, it begins with a renewed appetite for the word of God. The people are saying, bring the book and read it. One of the reasons we know that we're not experiencing revival right now is that in much of Christianity, there's very little time for the Word of God. I hear people tell me all the time, they go to churches and the Bible's never even opened. I was down in 
place recently and there was a group of people coming and, and they, they, they came because they said that we, where we've been going to church, they never ever opened the scriptures. Isn't that amazing? Never opened the scriptures. I like, what do they do? I don't know what they do. I know exactly what they do. Entertainment is what they do. No edification, just entertainment. That's what's going on. And so I would say a large portion of contemporary Christianity, there's very little time for the Word of God. And you, you know, it can be like that in assemblies too. I remember one time I drove a uh, long distance. I won't say where I was going and where I was coming from, but it was a long distance, including an overnight stay to get to this place. And by the time all the preliminaries were over, I had about 15 minutes all the stuff that was going on, all the preliminaries, by the time we got to the... And I said to the elders, I said, don't ever invite me back. I'm not usually that forthright, but I just, I just thought, this is a waste of my time. And I just said to them, I said, what do you expect to build here on 15-minute little sermonettes? Sermonettes produce Christianettes. You know, it really, it doesn't work very well. And so I said, you know, like, why do you... And so anyway, they invited me to speak in the evening, and they gave me 55 minutes. So, and I've been back many times, and they took it from the Lord. I'm thankful that they did. But, but again, it's so easy to get into this, that uh, you have all these preliminary things, and the Word of God is just pushed out, pushed out, pushed out, so there's hardly any time for the Word of God. And, so, and, and what the people are hungry for here is the Word of God. They spoke to Ezra, bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord commanded to Israel. Bring the book. We want to... Hear the book read. And of course, we, we do know, uh, actually from the previous chapter, verse 73, when we're, this is taking place. Notice verse 73 of chapter 7. It says, So the priests, the Levites, the porters, the singers, some of the people, the Nethanims, and all Israel dwelt in their cities. And when the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities. So it's the seventh month. Now, when you get to the seventh month, Leviticus 23, God's calendar tells us that, that it's festival time. And so there's the Feast of Trumpet. That's the first day of the seventh month. And then you go from the Feast of Trumpets, and you have the Day of Atonement. And then you go from the Day of Atonement, and you're into the Feast of Tabernacles. It's festival time of the year. And so this is when it's all taking place uh, during the festivals. So they want Ezra to bring the book. And it happens to be on the Feast of Trumpets. And so it says in verse 2, Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding. So I want you to notice that the gathering here uh, is, is uh, it's, it's families, men and women, and all the children that could hear with understanding. Uh, it was in, uh, intended to be read in the hearing of families. Yeah, and again, I just want to say this, that it's important, is it, that God's word is for families. Yeah, and it's important that families are together hearing the word of God. I can remember our children when they were small and they would they'd be there seated in the, in the Lord's Supper and they'd just be quietly uh, coloring. And, and uh, amazingly, later on in the, in the week, you might hear one of them, I think a grace, she comes to my mind, she'd be there coloring again in, at home and she'd be singing, Jesus, the very thought of thee with sweetness fills my breath. Word perfect. We didn't teach her it. How did she get that? She just was there. She heard it. It's affecting her. It's coming in. Amazing, isn't it? What a wonderful thing to expose your children to these rich treasures. And so uh, there are families here, all that could hear with understanding, on the first day of the seventh month. And it says, verse 3, And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday. <laughs> Kind of a lengthy meeting, isn't it? In the open air, from morning till midday. Like, again, these people, they have, at this point in their history, they have an appetite for the Word of God. And I, I suspect they weren't comfortable seats in the streets. But they're there. I can remember being in the underground church in China, we were in a building. We, we, we went in twos and threes. They didn't want to draw attention. We got in this, this building. It was a, an apartment complex that had been finished, but there was no heat, no furniture, no carpets, just concrete. And so we're all in this room, 
and it's freezing. They told me beforehand, take some long johns. So, so uh, it, was, it was really, really cold. So here we are. We're all st- there's no seats. Everybody's standing. Everybody. And so uh, one of the leading brothers there, he said, uh, he said, Brother Atwood, he said, we want two hours of ministry. So I said, okay. So I preached for two hours. No singing, because the last thing you want to do is let people know where you are. The authorities would have come, so there's no singing. So just two hours of straight Bible teaching, and they were weeping as they heard the Word of God. Gives you goosebumps to even think about it, doesn't it? And here, you dare go a minute over 12. My wife has said people come up to her, this is true, and say to her, you need to teach your husband to do this. I mean, isn't that amazing? Because I don't want to be late in the line at Swiss Chalet, you know? I mean, I've got to get, to, I've got to get there on time, and this guy is, is five minutes over. I'm just preparing you for tonight. I'm just getting you ready for this, you see. <laughs> but, but isn't it interesting that there's such a, an appetite? People can watch rubbish for hours on end. Binge watching. Have you ever heard of that? People binge watch, apparently, whole soap opera series. The whole thing. And yet, ask them to hear a 45-minute message. Oh, that's a bit long. We need to cut it down a little bit. You know? That's just the mentality of the day. But here, there's families. They're standing out. They're listening to the Word of God. They're eager to hear the Word of God. And it says in verse 3, and he read therein uh, from the morning till midnight, uh, before the men and the women at uh, midday, th- those that could understand, and the ears of the people were attentive unto the book of the law. Isn't that a beautiful thing? The people are actually paying attention. They're attentive. They want to hear from God. I, I hope that's what you came with that mindset tonight. I want to hear something from God. God, speak to me. Uh, and, and I hope you prayed about that. Lord, I want to hear from you tonight. I want to hear something from you. Uh, but these people, they were attentive. They, they were eager. They, you see, Scripture says it over and over again, doesn't it? He that has ears to hear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And, and the question is, do we really have ears to hear? Are we really attentive? Are we listening? Are we, is this going to make any difference in your life? Or is it just another meeting you're attending? Or you're coming with that attentiveness, a desire to, to really hear from God? Notice an interesting thing, verse 5. It says, Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Interesting. All the people stood up. Never forget it. I was uh, doing a series of meetings, and there was a lady there. She was a, 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 a young girl, but she was, she was um, I guess there, there, are, there are kind of embryos that are out there uh, that are frozen. I, I forget what they call them, snowflakes or something like that. And anyway, somebody had adopted this embryo, and... She now was a grown teenage woman and a Jewish woman. But she was a believer. She'd been, she'd been adopted by a Christian family. And um, anyway, uh, this, every time I would read the scripture, this girl would stand up for the reading of the word of God. She was the only person in the whole auditorium. And it was a large auditorium, and she'd stand up. And she did it every time I read from, even if in the middle of the message, I said, now turn to this passage, and I started, she'd stand up for the word of God. So the last day, I said, okay, now I want everybody to stand up. I just didn't want this girl to feel like she was the only one, so we all stood up. But I, I, I know what she was saying. She was saying, I, I want to give proper reverence to the word of God. Isn't that wonderful? Praise God for that. And, and here, they have a reverence for the word of God. They, they're, they're standing up because God's word is being read to them. It was given a place of prominence. Notice that Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood. The only reference that we have, uh, I think, as far as I know in Scripture, to a pulpit of wood. And it seems like he was um, 
on a platform. I think, again, it's the only example of a platform in Scripture because it says in verse 5, Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. And so you get the picture that he's, he's behind a pulpit of wood, uh, he's above all the people, and then when he begins to read, all the people stand up in, in reverence. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about furniture for a minute. This is not a, a, a sidetrack. This is important because it's, it's really interesting to me. Again, I, one of the things that I'm very passionate about is church history. And what is interesting is that often furniture is a reflection of theology. Let me give you an example. During the Dark Ages, when Catholicism was dominant, all the churches had an altar. Growing up, I grew up Roman Catholic myself, and we would go forward to the altar to receive the host. And the whole communion thing is Christ re-offering himself as an unbloody sacrifice. And you literally thought, in fact, I remember as a child being taught, don't bite the host because that's literally the body of Christ. And so their theology is that it isn't finished, that he still has to be offered every time the Mass is said. And by the way, it's blasphemy, absolute blasphemy, because it is finished. When Christ said it is finished, it's finished. Nothing had to be added. Nothing had to be tweaked. He did a perfect work the first time over. Nothing has to be added to that work. But their theology was reflected in their furnishings. Then you had the Protestant Reformation. And if you know anything about the Protestant Reformation is that they built really high pulpits. Yeah, so, so high that by the time you climb up them, you got, you're having a nosebleed because you're, you're in the clouds. Your altitude is so high. I mean, I'm not exaggerating, well, maybe slightly, but, but, they, but they were high because what are they saying? In the Reformation, we are elevating the Word of God. And then, in the 1800s, there's another revival, isn't there? A, a revival of New Testament Christianity, and all of a sudden now, you have people sitting in circles, and in the middle, there's a, a table in a loaf and a cup. What are they saying? Our theology is this. We believe that when we gather together, Christ is in the midst, and we're gathered around the person of Christ, Right? So, and now, what's the theology of today? A drum kit, lights, stage, action, right? What is it? The theology of entertainment and me-centered Christianity. That's exactly what it's saying. And that's much of Christendom today. I had a friend, he, was, uh, he went to a um, school to learn to be a worship leader in a megachurch. Believe it or not, you can go to school and learn how to do it. And he and his wife were involved in a megachurch church plant, I think somewhere out in Arizona, and it was going great guns. And he and his wife would work on all the music and all the rest of it, and they said they were so busy getting ready for the next performance, they never had chance to read their Bibles. Here they are leading the whole congregation supposedly in worship, but they don't have time to read their Bibles. And they were getting kind of, well, you know, if you're not in the Word of God, no matter what you're doing for the Lord, you're going to get thin spiritually. You have to feed your own soul. You really, you can't survive spiritually without feeding your soul. And so they're, they're dying on the vine. And then... Um, they, one day, one of the big lights on the stage went out, so they called the janitor, and he just reminded them how much those bulbs cost. And it, I mean, it was, I don't know what it did, but it was thousands of dollars for this one bulb. And he and his wife were getting pretty disillusioned at this stage. They drove past homeless people on the way to the meeting, and they're spending thousands of dollars on a light bulb. And so my friend says, I can't live like this anymore. So they quit, and they, they said, we want to find the simplest church we can find where the only attraction is Jesus Christ. 
You see, people come with a shopping list of what they're looking for in a church. How about this? I want to find a church where the only, the only attraction is Jesus Christ. They ended up in a little assembly, and they love it. They're just blossoming spiritually. It's amazing, isn't it? This is, this is, the, this is where we're at, furniture-wise. And so here, they're elevating the Word of God. And, of course, it's important for us to recognize that everything we do is based on Scripture. There's never been a revival without the Word of God. In Scripture, whenever there's a revival, it's getting back to Scripture, isn't it? In the Old Testament, Revelation, uh, revival under Hezekiah, under Josiah, it's always a back-to-the-book movement, always. It's always a recovering of lost truth movement. It's getting back to the Scriptures. In fact, uh, I have a, a friend, he's an Indian brother, and he has a very difficult time pronouncing the letter V. So when he says revival, what he actually says is revival. But he's not far wrong. Because a spiritual revival is a re-Bible. It's getting back to the proper place of Scripture in our lives, in our family lives, in our individual lives, in our assembly lives. It's, it's a back-to-the-book movement. It's what saith the Lord. It's to the law and the testimony. It's, it's, that's what it is. Now, I want you to notice, too, that not only is this return to the Word of God, this hunger for the Word of God, this reverence for the Word of God, but notice verse 6. There's also a restoration of the worship of God. Notice what it says in verse 6. It says, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So Ezra prayed prior to his exposition of Scripture, and it produced a profound response from the people. He blessed the Lord. The idea is this. He spoke well of the Lord. He elevated the Lord in his speech, calling him the great God. Isn't that wonderful? He, he says, he blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people responded, amen, amen, and amen. I love the people responding. Now, again, I'm, I can tell you, um, I'm not Pentecostal. But I think amen is a legitimate word, and it would do us good sometimes to say it a bit more often than we usually do. Um, I sometimes have the privilege of preaching in Caribbean assemblies, and I have to say I love it because they talk right back to you, and it's wonderful. And, you know, preachers feed off the audience and sometimes you feel like you're a bottom feeder. I mean, there's just not, not much out there. You, it's crumbs, deadpan faces, sometimes, sadly, people sitting in judgment on the Word of God rather than allowing the Word of God to sit in judgment on them. But, <laughs> amen is okay. It's a very, you know what it means? So be it. Let it be so. Okay to say that if you want it to be so. If you want revival, you should say, amen, let it be so. I'm not trying to get the crowd going here. I'm just, obviously, it's hard work anyway. You can see that. But, but notice it says, not only did they bless the Lord, the great God, all the people answered, amen, and amen. And then it says, they lifted up their hands, bowed their heads, and worshiped the Lord. Now, again, we, we just want to be careful about how we think about things. Now, I just want to say this. Now, lifting up the hands is a legitimate posture in prayer. Now, probably the reason we don't do it is because the charismatics do it. Is that, a, is that a good reason to do something, by the way? Because they do it? Or would it be a good reason to do it because it's in the Word of God? Now, what are, what are they doing? What's the posture saying? What they're saying is this. Lord, we're empty-handed. We don't have any bargaining chips. We have nothing to bring. You have everything. We're looking to you for blessing. Now, I like that posture. I think that makes a lot of sense. And if you really want to know, sometimes when I'm private on my own, I do it. Now, I won't do it in the meeting because I don't want to attract attention to me. I want the Lord to be the one who gets the attention. But it's okay. It's a legitimate posture. 
And, and, and it certainly has the idea of this. We're coming to a God who has everything, and we have nothing. And everything we need, he has. We need it, Lord. We're, we're empty-handed. And, and then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. We uh, learned on uh, the Lord's Day on a completely different topic, that first mention of worship. It's always bowing down to kiss the ground. And, uh, and, and there's no music in connection with those first mentions. And, and, and so sometimes you can have the most amazing music, but there could be no bowed hearts at all. But, but to bow down, to kiss the ground. And so these people are genuinely worshiping the Lord. And of course, in revival, one of the things, not only a reverence for the word of God, but there's a return to genuine, true, heartfelt worship that is always connected with revival. Because we get a better view of God. We see him for who he is, the great God, the powerful God, and it results in genuine worship. The third thing we'll see here is a comprehension of the Scriptures. They, they, they're really given help to understand the Scriptures. Look at chapter 8, verse 7. It says, uh, I'm not going to list the names of those people again, but uh, if you go to the end of the list of names, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. Notice again in verse 8, it says, So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and cause them to understand the reading. And then look at verse 12. It says, All the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. The word of God was read to them orally and clearly. And again, we must give attention to the public reading of the Scriptures. And then it was explained, the meaning was brought out to them so they knew what the text was saying and how it applied to them and, and how it was to affect their lives. And so they went away with a great understanding of the Scriptures. And we have to say this, that one of the great needs of today is what I would call solid sound, expositional Bible teaching. So we know what the Word of God is saying and how it's supposed to impact our lives. So we can respond to it, so we can put it into practice. And, and as you look again at church history, uh, men that have been greatly used of God, and not men that tried to sound clever and pompous on the platform, but men that broke it down so that people could really understand it. I love reading Harry Ironside. You know why? Because I can get it. I understand what he's saying. I, I remember the first church we were ever involved in after we got saved. It was, a, it was a, uh, an amillennial, five-point Calvinist church. We didn't know. It wasn't like that when we first went there, but it became that way. And the guys were preaching, and it was like jumbo jets going over my head. I said to my wife, I could never be a preacher. I have no idea where they're getting this from. I couldn't make any connection with the text. And if I'd have stayed there, I probably never would have become a preacher. Because I couldn't understand it. And it might have seemed, seemed clever, but what's the use of cleverness if the saints can't understand it? We need to keep it simple. So even a child can understand it. Greatest compliment you could get is when a child comes up to you and tells you something you've just said and said, oh, that really spoke to me. A child, that's thrilling. You know you're getting it where it needs to be. Because adults are just big children anyway. And if the ch little children got it, the big children got it too. And so again, just that, that simplicity of communicate in the Word of God. And that, that really is part of this revival, that people are understanding what God is saying, what the Word of God means, and it's a blessing to their souls. Notice as well that there's, there's weeping. Verse 9, it says, Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people and said to all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the word of the law. Why do you think they were weeping? Because the scripture is convicting. 
Sometimes people say, oh, that's too convicting, and, and they'll say, you're getting at us. I said, no, all we're doing is lifting up the mirror. If you saw in the mirror something you didn't like, that's not my problem. It's your problem. I'm just lifting up the mirror. The mirror is the Word of God, right? And so, so the idea is this, that the Word of God, when it's preached correctly, when, when it's expounded properly, it will have a convicting effect. Listen, it's a sword. It's a sharp, two-edged sword. You have to expect to be cut sometimes. If a guy's wielding a sword, he's going to cut you. It's a hammer. Sometimes you feel like you're being smashed to pieces. Well, maybe you need that. It's a hammer. It's a fire. Sometimes you're going to get burned with the Word of God. Because that's how the Bible describes itself, isn't it? A sword, a hammer, a fire. Those things can be hurtful sometimes. But the wonderful thing about the Word of God is that it wounds with the thought of healing. It shows you what's wrong, but it shows you how to get right. And that's the beauty of it, isn't it? And so there's remorse for sin. And when there's revival, when there's an awareness of the Word of God, there's remorse for sin. It usually comes along with it. And uh, we see things like King Josiah ripping his garments as the Word of God was read because he realized how far his people had got away from God. And during times of revival, this happens. There's a great, uh, interesting statement from a man called George Bernard Shaw. He was an Irish playwright, and he once had a Bible. He sold it to an auctioneer in 1950, four years before he died. The auctioneer sold it after Shaw's death. One of its selling points was the inscription on the flyleaf written by the playwright himself. This is what he says. Except as a curiosity, this book is the most undesirable possession. I must get rid of it. I really cannot bear it in my house. Isn't that amazing? Couldn't even stand to have it in his house. Why? It's just a book, isn't it? <laughs> no, it's not just a book. It's a living book. It's a convicting book. And his perverted lifestyle... He couldn't even bear to have this book in his house. Isn't that amazing? And I tell you, you get away from the Lord, and you won't want this book. You'll do everything you can. You want to hear it. You won't want to read it because it's going to convict you, and you don't want that. It's a very powerful book. But these people, they are under conviction. The word of God's being read. They're weeping. And then notice that the weeping turns into joy. Verse 10, then he said unto them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, send portions to them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto the Lord, neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And again, it, there's a great sense of joy now. Of course, it's they're going into the Feast of Tabernacles, and that's the festival that is all about rejoicing. And so they, they do that, they uh, and, of course, they're keeping the feast. Notice verse 13. It says, uh, and again, this is, another, this is number six in revival. Rejoicing in fellowship with God is number five. Number six is obedience to the word of God. On the second day were gathered together, verse 13, the chief of the fathers of all the people, the priests, the Levites, unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month, and that they should publish and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go forth unto the mount, fetch olive branches and pine branches and myrtle branches and palm branches and branches of thick trees to make booths as it is written. So the people went forth and brought them and made themselves booths, every one upon the roof of his house, and in their courts, and in the courts of the house of God, and in the street of the water gate, in the street of the gate of Ephraim, and the congregation of them that were come again out of the captivity, made booths, sat under the booths. And notice this, this is verse 17. For since the days of Joshua the son of Nun, unto that day had not the children of Israel done so, and there was very great gladness. Isn't that a staggering verse? 
that they had not kept the Feast of Tabernacles since the days of Joshua. Hard to imagine. I mean, the Leviticus 23 is pretty simple to understand. It lays out the festivals in their calendar, and yet for a thousand years, it had been neglected. And all of a sudden, in this revival, that which has been long neglected is once again put back into practice. Isn't that interesting? And when there's a genuine revival, that's why I believe that the, the restoration of New Testament Christianity 200 years ago in Dublin, Ireland, when that group of people met together, and it wasn't just there, it was in other places too. It seemed to be a spontaneous move of the Spirit of God, and these people met to break bread without an, a clergyman officiate. It was a revolutionary act. And you know what's interesting? And I, you may not have thought about this, but it was actually a young people's movement. I know it's hard for us to think of that now. But when you look at the ages of those men that first broke bread in Dublin, the youngest man, his name was Lord Stokes, was 19. The oldest was 28. Isn't that hard to imagine? taking a step like this. But what are they doing? For 200 years, um, this truth had, had, well, it's been practiced now, but, but before that, for centuries, it had not been that you couldn't do it without a clergyman present. And, and so it was a, a remarkable, remarkable thing. And when there's genuine revival, there's always a truth recovered that at some point had been lost. It's a getting back to the simplicity of the Word of God. So, we might ask the question, are we ready for revival? Are we praying for revival? Uh, do we see that we need revival? Maybe you think everything's fine. If you do, you'll never see revival. Revival only comes to people who are not content with the status quo and long to see a work done where the only explanation is God. Even the enemies had to say, this work was wrought of God. Wouldn't you want to be part of a work like that? And so it starts with you and me. Lord, my heart's grown a bit cold. I'm kind of going through the motions a bit, Lord. Will you start the revival with me? Cause me to love your word in a fresh way again. Cause me to hunger to hear the word of God, to want to be under the sound of the word of God, to long to be at meetings, not any excuse that I'm not coming. That's the day we're living in. Oh, we desperately need it. In fact, if I could say this, as I look at our continent, the only hope that I see for North America is revival and awakening. I, I see no hope in the political system. Mind you, I never did, so nothing's changed, but I definitely do not see any hope there. Lord, unless you do something, it's over for Western civilization but often in the bleakest times. And remember how this book started? Does it look bleak? The walls of Jerusalem are in ruins. The gates are burned. It's not looking good. All it took was a spark plug. Just one spark plug, the engine fired, and all of a sudden, everything changes. Physically, everything looks better. Spiritually, everything looks better. And we desperately need the Lord to light a fire in our day.